but I want to invite you to open your Bibles up to 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to start off in John chapter 10, verse 2 through 5, and catch up to you there in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Did you guys enjoy the message last week with Gary Zaleski? Did you guys enjoy that? Oh, man. It was powerful. I was, I was laughing a good part of the time. Um, one of our staff, uh, uh, Bobby here, Bobby Hart, said that her daughter was watching online, texting her, Mom, I can hear you laughing the whole time. That was awesome. That was awesome. Um, no, it, it, once you get to know Gary, he throws some people off, but once you get to know him, he, he is a blessing. Um, John chapter 10, verse 2 through 5 here. God still speaks today. This is what it says. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. The sheep follow him. Say, follow him. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice voice. They follow him for they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'll catch up to you there starting in verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel... And he answered, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And he said, "Uh, what? what? Uh, I didn't call. Could you go lie down again? And he went and he lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And he answered, "Uh, I did not call. I'm, I'm trying to get some sleep. I have one less hour of sleep tonight because of daylight savings. I'm trying to sleep. I did not call my son. Could you go lie down again, please? Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli uh, gave up on sleeping that night. Wait, it doesn't say that in there. I just added that. I'm sorry. Then Eli gave up on sleeping and perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. It is powerful. It has the ability to transform our lives, God. And so we ask that your word would speak to us this morning, God. Father, we agree with Romans chapter 1 that says the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, We confess this morning, Lord, I'll confess this morning as a pastor, I have no other trick up my sleeve. I have no other gimmick. I have no other strategy to bring transformation in people's lives, in our city, in our nation, in our world. The only thing that changes the sinful heart of men is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No philosophy, no opinion, no debate, no policy from Washington will ever cure the sin in the heart of mankind. But the gospel of Jesus Christ A a naked, sinless man dying on a cross for our sins and rising from the grave. That is the only hope we have this morning, God. It's the only hope for our world this morning, God. It's the only hope for our nation this morning, God. It's the only thing, Lord, that needs to be multiplied and spread throughout the earth is the good news of Jesus Christ. And we believe, God. We believe if we're obedient, Lord God to carry your good news. We believe you are faithful, Lord, to confirm your word with miracle signs and wonders, with changed lives, Lord God, with changed nations, Lord God, with another great awakening in our country, Lord God, that will heal, Lord God. It will heal our rebellion, Lord. It will heal our wickedness, God. It will heal, Lord God, the division, Lord God, and the bitterness, Lord God. We need, Lord Jesus, the manifestation of the power of the good news in this hour, God. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's just good to pray sometimes. Amen. The Lord's will is for us to know his voice. It's his will. We looked at this. We started unpacking this two weeks ago. And we talked about how we, we have become in the New Testament, the New Covenant, a priesthood of all believers. That in the Old Testament, there was a few like Samuel, who were anointed by God to hear from God. But Jesus, when he died on the cross, the curtain in the temple that separated the holy of holies from the holy place in the outer court, the the curtain that only the high priest could go through to once a year, it was torn from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. That by faith in Jesus Christ, by the tearing of his flesh, he tore down the curtain that separated us from the holy of holies. And now, as we have faith in Jesus, we all have access to go before the throne of grace boldly, to go into his presence, to hear and be filled with the Holy Spirit and hear his voice and for the gifts of the Spirit to be active in our life so that we can minister as a kingdom of priests to a lost and hurting world. And it's not just something we need to know is available to us. It's not just a nice option. It's not just nice to know. The Lord has given us access to this because it's his will for us to know his voice. It's part of our discipleship. It's part of us as disciples following Jesus. What's one of the ways you follow Jesus? You know his voice. You know when he's speaking. You know when he's saying your name. You know when he's saying, come this way. Follow me this way. You haven't been this way before, but I've been this way before. I know this way really good. And if you trust me and follow me, I'll lead you in this way you've never been before. And you'll see things you've never seen before. If you know my voice. The Lord wants us to know his voice. And he wants us to hear his voice because he is speaking. He's speaking. He's speaking to you more than you probably realize. He's speaking to the body of Christ more than the church realizes. Look at this verse in Psalms 139, 17 and 18. I love this passage. The psalmist says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. God's thoughts towards us, it's it's another form of God speaking to us, right? How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the mathematical sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Remember, this is being written to a Middle Eastern audience in the desert. I don't know if you know anything about deserts. Vegas, do you know anything about deserts? But in deserts, there is a lot of sand. Do I have a witness here this morning, right? How many found some sand on your windshield after those winds blew through here last weekend, right? And he says to a Middle Eastern audience, he says, God's thoughts towards you. God is speaking more thoughts to you than there is grains grains of sand. Grains of sand in the earth. It is an innumerable number. You cannot even count it. You cannot even fathom it. You're going to need more than an abacus to figure that out, right? God is speaking to you. He is raining down from heaven his thoughts for your life. If you read the whole passage, you'll see that he actually had all your days, he had all the days of your life written down in his book before you were ever born. And he's trying to release them. That is why we live in such a noisy, distracted, contentious world. That's why sometimes when you go on your social media feed, it's like a dumpster fire. Now, I know that represents a lot of hurting people that Jesus wants to minister to. So I say that, you know, tongue in cheek. But the reality is we have a lot of noise in our world today. And it's not By chance, it's not just a coincidence. It is Satan trying to run interference in your life because he knows and he sees and he hears the voice of God that is trying to rain down destiny on you. And he wants to come in and bring distortion. 
He wants to come in and bring distraction. He wants to come in and bring discouragement and guilt and condemnation and make you not want to pick up your Bible and make you not want to worship and make you not want to pray and make you not want to go to church. He wants to do everything he can because he knows that the thoughts of, of God towards your life are greater than the sands of the seashore and he doesn't want you to hear them. The most powerful words we can hear is God saying, I love you. You want to talk about the prophetic? You want to talk about hearing the voice of God? Let me ask you a question as a pastor who loves you and prays for you. When was the last time you heard God say, I love you? When was the last time you received a fresh impartation of God's love that you knew, that you knew, that you knew in your knower that God loved you? You know, when was the last time? If it's been a long time, God the Father is longing to lavish his grace on you afresh. God is longing to to bring fresh encouragement into every crack and crevice of your heart. And it also should show you how hard the enemy is working to disrupt what God is trying to release in your life. If it's been a long time before you felt the father say, daughter, I love you. Son, I love you with no strings attached. If it's been a long time before you've heard that, you can see how hard the enemy is working against your destiny. He's working hard. He's working overtime because he knows, man, if you know his voice, oh, if you start to follow him, you are going to be dangerous. You're going to be dangerous. Dangerous for Jesus, that is. Got to clarify. Now, hearing the Lord's voice is critical, but many of us, even believers, we're like Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're not discerning the Lord's voice properly, you know? And, and people will say, man, I wish I could hear the audible voice of God. Man, I, I wish I could go out to the desert like Moses and some burning cactus would begin to say my name and talk to me and call me. I, I wish God could just make it obvious to me. It's so much easier if I could just hear the audible voice of God. But listen, Samuel was hearing the audible voice of God and he was still missing it. The audible voice of God was calling him, and he still wasn't able to discern it. And so don't presume, don't assume that, that, that there's just something God has to do in order for you to hear. He might already be speaking to you in many ways, shapes, and forms, and you're just not tuned in to hear him. You don't know his voice and his heart yet to recognize it. So I want to share with you three facets to knowing the Lord's voice. There actually can be a process in, in knowing, someone say knowing, oh, that we would intimately be acquainted with the voice of God, that we would be so familiar with that voice, that we would be able to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The first facet is this, is there's revelation, revelation, that God wants to reveal himself to us by speaking to us. And there's a lot of different ways that God wants to speak to us. God speaks to us through many forms. Uh, And in fact, if you're in your small group this week, Pastor Kristen Elizondo does the video teaching this week in in the God Still Speaks Today small group series, and she goes deeper on this, a great compliment to to the message this morning. But how many knows that God speaks to us first and foremost through his word, through the 66 books of Revelation, through Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, God is speaking to us his word. And it's an interesting dynamic we have in the body of Christ today. There is a great passion and a, and, and a great movement towards the prophetic, and I praise God for that. And yet at the same time, there can be a great passion for the prophetic. There can be a great ignorance about prophecy, right? Isn't that interesting? That there is a lot of biblical ignorance today and a lot of prophetic ignorance today, and yet there's a great passion for the prophetic, right? If you want to continue to grow in hearing God's voice, if you want to continue to grow in the gift of prophecy, it'd be good to know the prophetic word of God that's already been written and delivered to us, right? This book 
is predictive prophecy. A good portion of it has already been fulfilled to us as a sign and a wonder and a confirmation. There is historical documentation and verification of the accuracy of this word. And if someone, if some cynic, if some debater out there is telling you that the word of God is not historically accurate, I'm telling you there's two things. One, they either have not done their homework or two, they are not being honest with themselves. For the age of this document, it is one of the most historically verified documents, translated documents there is amongst all of its comparative peers. There's a good portion of prophecy in this book that also has yet to be fulfilled, that is going to be fulfilled. Every year we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the prophecies that came to pass about the virgin giving birth to the Messiah who would bring salvation to the wor world. But it's also not just a reminder of the prophecies that came to pass, it's a reminder of the prophecies that are going to come to pass because he came once as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, but the Bible says he's coming again as a conquering king to rule and reign in the earth and just as sure as he came to Bethlehem on that Christmas night he's coming again to finish the job amen oh that we would be ready on that day so God speaks to us through his word he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit he, he, he speaks to our mind. He speaks to our heart, which is why it's so important that we're in a proper uh, disposition of receiving from him. If we are distracted, if we are polluted, if we're full of toxicity, it's going to be difficult for the Holy Spirit to speak to our mind and our heart. And we talk more about that in the small group this week. He speaks to us by his Holy Spirit. He speaks to us through other believers. Through other believers, he will speak to us. And I want to tell you this. It's really important that if, if, if God is giving you a word from another believer, a word that you're considering banking on and doing something with, I would encourage you, make sure it's a word that's bringing confirmation to something that God is already doing. Right? I'm not saying that God can't reveal something to you for the first time through another believer, but if it's the first time you're getting something like that from God, I would take it, tuck it in your heart, and pray on it and wait for God to confirm it. That God does want to speak to us in the community of believers. He wants to speak to us through spiritual leaders. He wants to speak to us through times in our small group and getting prayer. He wants to speak to us at those times. But let it be a process of God confirming the word in your life. So he speaks to us through his word, his spirit, other believers. He speaks to us through experiences. There's a lot of experience, God's uh, experiences that God can give us. And we, we talk more about that this week. He can give us dreams and visions. He can give us miracle signs and wonders. Miracles can, can deliver a message to us as well. He can speak to us in all different types of creative ways. But you know one of the most underrated ways God will speak to us through experiences, especially I've seen in prophetic culture? God will speak to us through circumstance. He'll speak to us through circumstance. And I could give you a lot of different examples, but I'll, I'll, I'll just use a simple one here that, that, could, that you could parallel out into others. I mean, I'm, I've had this as a youth pastor. I thought when I was done being a youth pastor, I thought I would stop getting um, someone come to me with this word from God. But as I've, as I've continued on beyond youth ministry, I, I still continue to get this word from God. But it's this. It's, it's, Pastor, God has spoken to me. Well, that's great. What has he spoken to you? God showed me who my spouse is. Well... Praise God. Do they know? Do they, do they know who you are? I don't even think they know who you are. And, and, and listen, I, I've heard uh, a few testimonies where some of those stars align and some of those things come to pass. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as an approach. I wouldn't recommend it as an asking out tool. Hey, God spoke to me. My name's Andrew. God spoke to me, and, and you're supposed to be my wife. Uh, would you like to go out to dinner? Singles, giant red flag, giant red flag, okay, giant red flag. Uh, allow the Lord to confirm that, okay? Allow the Lord to, to do some alignment and, and create that. You can introduce yourself and talk, but maybe hold off on the thus says the Lord, you're my spouse. Maybe hold off on that one, okay? If that's your testimony, God bless you. It was meant to be, all right? But there's many other people that do that. Uh, don't do that, okay? So, for example, someone has this word. I, I would counsel them, you know, Tuck that in your heart. Pray about that. God bless you. That's great. You know, let's see what happens. And then as time goes on, that person that God has spoken them to about, that person gets engaged and gets married, follow me now, to another person. 
That would be the Lord speaking through circumstance. That would be the Lord saying, hey, this person isn't the one you're supposed to marry. They're actually in covenant with another person now, okay? And, and, and when we have desires in our heart and we have uh, intense emotions about something in our heart, it, it, it can, it can um, decrease the accuracy. It can increase the probability of distortion, right? This is just some pastoral wisdom. Some of you are getting mad at me. I love you. I'm trying to help you right now, okay? You're getting so mad at me. How dare you tell me I didn't hear from God? Listen, Psalms 37, Psalms 37 verse 4 says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. A very beautiful scripture. It doesn't mean that Jesus is Santa Claus, all right, it doesn't mean we just prop up our wish list and we get what everyone, what it means is if we delight ourselves, someone say self, spirit, soul, body, if we consecrate ourselves, if we surrender ourselves on the altar, if we offer ourselves as Romans 12 says, as a living sacrifice, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, we will have an encounter with him and he will come into our heart and he will begin to shape the desires of our heart to the desires of his heart. And now when I have a desire from heaven and I speak that out in prayer, I come into alignment with the forces of heaven for heaven to come down and act on my behalf and see the will of God come to pass. That is what it means to delight yourself. Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. The good news is Christianity can be fun. Christianity is not all obligation. Yes, there's times we need to die to ourselves. Yes, there's times we need to resist our flesh. Yes, there's times we need to have great godly discipline. But there are times when God will actually give us his desires and obeying God will be a fulfillment of desire. It will be a tree of life to our soul to serve Jesus and represent him in the earth. But you got to surrender to him. Notice here, this revelation, Samuel's having trouble with this revelation stage. He's not getting the revelation. He doesn't know that it's God speaking. But notice it comes in waves of threes, three, three to four, right? Just a side note, something interesting. I've, uh, it's not consistent. It's, I don't want to create some hard legalistic rules here. I'm just telling you many times in my life, I've heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit, and it can come in waves of threes or fours. Where, where, where the Holy Spirit can, can give me something. And, and, and I'm like, I don't know about that. And it can come again. I'm like, well, I don't know about it. I, I shared in the first service that um, we had, I, I was praying for a student at the altar years ago. And I was like, God, give me a word. And I give my, I'm like, God, give me a word for this young man. Give me a word for this young man. And, and I got nothing. I mean nothing. However much nothing is, that's how much I had. I had nothing until two words popped into my head. Bass guitar. Lord, if you could just give me a word for this young man, Lord, something powerful. God, I want this. I want him to get, he came to this altar for you, and I want him to get rocked right now, God. Bass guitar. God, if you could just give me a word, Lord, something powerful, Lord, something dynamic, Lord, something. Bass guitar. Shoot, is this from the Lord? So I asked the young man, I said, hey, do, do the words to the, the words bass guitar mean anything to you? He got a big smile on his face. He said, I, I play the bass guitar, and I've been asking Jesus if I should join the worship team or not. I wasn't sure. I said, bro, this is your confirmation in Jesus' name. You will lead worship on the bass guitar and bring people into the throne room of heaven in Jesus' name. Right? And so it can come in waves of threes and fours. It can stick with you. Random. What is a word of knowledge? It's, it's, it's knowledge that you don't have in your own ability and experience. Sometimes it feels like it's coming out of left field. Sometimes it feels random. And sometimes it is random because you share it with somebody and you say, does that mean anything to you? And they say, no, that doesn't mean anything to you. And you say, God bless you. I was way off. Samsonite, I was way off. Some of you might get that. Okay, here we go. Um, so there's revelation. The first facet of knowing the Lord's voice is revelation. Number two, interpretation. Say interpretation. Interpretation. You could have a revelation from the Lord, but you could mess up the interpretation. And so if you get the revelation from God, but you mess up the interpretation, the word is going to fall short of what it's meant to accomplish, right? And so many times we can have powerful experiences with God and powerful experiences with the word of God and with other believers, and we can get a revelation, but we don't take time to think through the interpretation, right? There, I was just reading this week in my devotions that I don't have in the notes. It's John chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. Jesus was growing in popularity 
And the, the religious leaders, the high priests, Caiaphas and, and the Pharisees, they were not excited about his increase in popularity because he was calling them all hypocrites. And they didn't, they didn't like this. And so they were meeting together talking about whether or not they should kill Jesus because he was, in their eyes, a false prophet. And the high priest Caiaphas said he had a word from God. And the word he had from God was that he, he tells everybody this. He says, I, I, God has shown me that it, it is necessary for Jesus, for one man to die for the entire nation of Israel. That was a revelation. But then he followed it up with some bad interpretation and other things, right? The, 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 the bad interpretation was that he, they thought Jesus in his waywardness, in his wrongheadedness, they thought that he would be used to, to pay a price to hold back Roman oppression, that the whole nation wouldn't take the, the, the brunt of Roman oppression, but this false prophet Jesus would take the, the brunt of Roman oppression. Therefore, let's go crucify Jesus, Good revelation. Jesus was called to die for the sins of the nation. He, it doesn't mean that he's a false prophet and you're supposed to crucify him, right? Bad interpretation and something else, which we'll get to here in a second. So you need to have revelation from God, but then you need to have proper interpretation. This is what I heard from God. Let's go King James for a second. What meaneth this? What meaneth this? I had this dream. I'm going to write it down, and I'm going to pray about it. What meaneth this? Can I tell you an interpretation a lot of believers uh, miss on many times? Try this next time you get a revelation from God about somebody else. God, am I supposed to share this, or am I supposed to pray about this? It's a good question if you're taking notes. God, am I supposed to share this, or am I supposed to pray about this? Can I tell you how many times God speaks to me for somebody else as a pastor and the Holy Spirit just commits me to pray for that person in a specific way? It's not to share on a mic. It's not to call them up and call them out. It's to have the heart of God for them. It's to pray for them. It's to pray into their situation. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes God will allow our paths to intersect at a certain point. And because I've been obediently praying according to the revelation of God, I am perfectly equipped in that moment with the proper anointing to minister to that person's situation because I've already been in prayer and intercession for them leading up to that moment. But so many times we get a revelation from God and, and, and we got we to gotta shout it from the rooftop, right? We got to go on social media and do a, a post, Right? Oh, there's a lot of posts that should have been prayers. Ooh, copy and paste, copy and paste. Let me say it again. This is 11 a.m. only. This didn't happen at 9 a.m. There's a lot of posts that should have been prayers. Oh, Jesus, there's a lot of posts that should have been prayers. A lot of posts, a lot of posts, but should have been prayers. Not prayers, but they were posts, but should have been prayers, but they posted, so there was no prayer. If only they prayed, they wouldn't have had to post, and then the prayer would have been answered by God, and so you wouldn't need any more posts because we prayed. Oh, we need, to, we need to not post, but we need to pray. There's a new title to this sermon this morning. I have a word from the Lord. Pray more than you post. Dear Father, would you, would you raise up a church, God, where we pray more than we post? May it be etched on my tombstone. This man prayed more than he posts. I'm half kidding. There's some pastor therapy happening here cathartically at the, at the exact same moment I'm preaching. No, we need revelation, and then we need interpretation. Someone say amen. amen. Revelation, interpretation, and then the third facet is application. Application. That's the part the, the, the religious leaders messed up on. They had the wrong interpretation. Jesus wasn't a false prophet, and their application was, let's crucify him. That was not the application they were supposed to. God was going to do it. He was going to fulfill it, but... but Man, the vessels on who made that decision, there was going to be judgment. So revelation, interpretation, application. Another example, I think of this, if you're taking notes, 1 Chronicles 17. 1 Chronicles 17, David has established the nation of Israel. He has conquered greater uh, territories within their, their inheritance of the promised land. And he, he gets a revelation that there is to be built a temple for a, as, as a permanent resting place for the ark of God. And 
he, he's interacting with Nathan, a prophet. A pro, someone say prophet. And, and he says in 1 Chronicles 17, he says basically, David, hey, go ahead and do all that's in your heart. Go ahead and do it. You got the revelation, the interpretation, the application. But Nathan goes away by himself, and the Lord corrects him. The Lord corrects the prophet. And he says, no, David's not supposed to build the temple. David has been a man of bloodshed. He is supposed to have his son build this temple. And so the prophet, so David gets the revelation. The prophet gets the revelation. David, who wrote Psalms, who was a man after God's own heart, David gets the interpretation and the application wrong, and the prophet gets the interpretation and the application wrong. Let that free you from pressure to be perfect all the time. But let it also give you some humility in this journey as well. Because Nathan has to go back to David and say, uh, remember all that stuff I said about uh, do whatever you want to do? Kind of ex nay on the build the temple A, okay, David? Like, you're not supposed to build it. It's supposed to have, it's, your son is supposed to build it. Solomon is supposed to build it. And Solomon builds this temple, and it turns in to the, the, the greatest revitalization, the greatest uh, season of prosperity when that temple is open that the nation of Israel ever had, right? But here's the thing. David had to humble himself. He had this revelation, and he had this plan, and he had this passion, and it was, I don't know if you know anything about, like, leaders, like, high-level leaders, like, alpha male leaders. They really like their ideas. None of my staff better be saying amen right now. <laughs> they really like their ideas, and it's, it would be easy for David to fall into the pattern of so many leaders go, this was my idea. We, we, we can eat, we, the only reason we can do this is because of me and because of my conquest. I, I'm not going to let my son do this. I'm supposed to do this. But no, David humbled himself. Even with a word from God, even with a word to build a temple for God, even with a word that was part of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, David humbled himself and said, no, this is not for me. This is for my son to do. I don't need the credit I don't need the stroke on my ego. I don't need to have another, another uh, notch on my belt, another trophy in the trophy case. I'm going to obey. I, I understand. I thought I knew what God was saying. But now as I process it through the interpretation, the application, I realize I was missing a portion of this. And it leads to tremendous historical blessing over the nation of Israel. And so you have to have the revelation and you have to have the interpretation, but you have to have the application. Worship team, if you guys could join me here on stage. And, and one of the things I would say regarding this is, is so many times God will give us a word for somebody, and we have to ask, what is the best way to deliver it? Because God is a God of love. And we've talked about how the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's a gift to encourage, to strengthen, and to comfort and I've seen so many words from God that there, there, there was, they, were, they were somewhere around the bullseye on the revelation and the interpretation, but as they delivered it, they, they missed the way on the application. There's a funny story of a, of a church service where a guy, um, you guys, have you ever heard the word Ichabod before? Ichabod, it's a Hebrew word. It means the glory has departed. Ichab, say Ichabod, right? The glory has departed. So there's this service going on and this guy stands up and he just begins to shout at the top of his lungs. And he's given this great rebuke to the church there. And thus says, God, this, and you've messed this up, and you've done this wrong. And, this, this. and he's, he's railing against the church, and he's walking out the door. And as he walks out the door, he says, and the Lord would write on this house, Michelob. And he walked out the door. Michelob. Can tell what spirit was behind the word right there. He meant to say Ichabod, right? But that should that should have told the audience everything they needed to know about the word. That was no, you got we gotta deliver this with the heart of God. Amen. The Lord's voice is the key to your calling. It's the key to your calling. This was how the Lord called Samuel. He called him through his voice by speaking to him. And again, we've talked about this, that the Lord wants to speak to everyone. Sometimes 
in our minds, we can reserve that word calling for people in clergy. But the Lord has a calling over every single believer's life. Whether you're in vocational ministry or not, God has a calling over you. Gary Zaleski shared the men's breakfast, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, which talks about the house which is swept and clean, but it's empty and put in order. But because it's empty, the spirit that was cast out goes out and gets seven spirits more wicked than the first to fill that empty house back up. And now the, the latter condition of the man is worse than the former. That it's, it's not enough to, to just have a clean house. You need Mr. Clean living in the house. No, Jesus, I'm talking about Jesus. I don't have the muscles to pull that one off. But what Gary Zaleski talked about is as Pentecostals, we talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit. And yes, we need to ask God to fill us with the Spirit. But this is what he added. He, he said, we need to be filled with the calling of God in our life. If you want to make sure your house isn't empty, ask yourself, am I filled with the calling of God? And how does God want to release that calling? He wants to speak to you through his voice so that he can hear the response. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The Lord has callings for many of you and he's ready and waiting to reveal, but you gotta take time to know his voice. Oh, pastor, I'm struggling in my life. I feel like I can't hear from God. I feel like I don't know the voice of God. Yes, I've been there. I know what you're saying. But can we change our confession so we can change the experience? Instead of saying we don't know the voice of God, can we say, I know Jesus. He is my shepherd. And John 10 says that, that his sheep know his voice. I thank you, Lord. I don't know everything you're doing, and I don't know how it's going to happen, but I thank you, Lord, by faith. I know your voice. I thank you. You're speaking to me more thoughts, Lord, from heaven than there are grains of sand on the she seashore, Lord. According to your word, Lord, you're speaking to me, Lord, and your servant is listening. Hallelujah. And we stand to our feet in this place. And we stand to our feet. Jesus, come on, just close your eyes. I just want to ask for no one to move. I'm going to get you out of here on time this morning. But I want to begin to worship. And I, I believe there's so many of you, you're more distracted than you realize. There's so much noise that the enemy is releasing in your mind because he sees what God wants to release. And if you could just break through the distraction, if you could break through the noise and all the different voices, you will begin to discern the voice of your shepherd and the voice of a stranger. And the Bible says, we don't listen to the voice of strangers. Hallelujah. Come on, can we just begin to worship God in this place? Come on, just begin to move away from the voice of the stranger right now. Let's worship him. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord, to breath. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour. Continue. Come on, can you go one step deeper? Come on, can you shift something inside of you right now? Come on, don't look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's here this morning.
eyes closed. The peace of God is here. Someone here, you've been battling sleepless, restless nights. And I'm telling you, the enemy has been trying to harass you. But right now, I plead the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your body. And we rebuke the enemy. If you resist the devil, the Bible says he has to legally flee. We resist him right now in the name of Jesus. I declare rest. I declare peace. I declare sleep. Sleep with dreams and with visions, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord, for a strengthening in the body, soul, and spirit, God, in the name of Jesus. And for every person here, God, I pray, Lord, we push past distractions. Lord, we identify obstacles. Lord, we'd repent of blessing blockers in our life, God, so we can get into the place of revelation, Lord God. Come on, this is the place of revelation right here. This is where the Lord wants you to live right here, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. This is the place of revelation the Lord wants you to live is right here. This is home right here. This is the happy place right here. Not alcohol, not weed, not temptation, not sin, not a casino. This is the happy place for your soul right here. This is it right here. This is it right here. Come on, just get comfortable right here. Don't be in a rush, don't be in a hurry. Get familiar right here. This is where his voice is, right here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Last thing. I'm going to close in a few minutes. You close your eyes. You're here this morning. And you say, Pastor, I don't know where I'm at with Jesus. We had a dear, precious leader in our church. Her name was Monique. She went home suddenly to be with the Lord just over a week ago. And we, we were all caught off guard. There was great grief and great loss of pain that were so processing. She was a chaplain in our city that served our city. But here's the thing, here's the thing. She was not caught off guard. She didn't know when she woke up that day she was gonna go home, but she was not caught off guard. She was serving Jesus. She was worshiping Jesus. She was living for Jesus. And she's up in heaven right now worshiping Jesus. And we're gonna be joined back with her again one day to worship around the throne with Monique. I wanna ask you this question, are you ready? There are thousands of promises in the Bible, but the Bible does not promise tomorrow. This is not a decision you wanna procrastinate on. You wanna go home and reflect on. I'm telling you, Jesus died on a cross. He rose from the grave so you could have faith in him. You could turn from unbelief, put your faith in him and know that you know that you know that your name's written in heaven. And if that's you, I'm going to count to three. I want to pray with you this morning. I don't want to leave anything to chance. I love you that much. I'm going to count to three. And if you need to get right with God, when I get to three, I want you to slip up a hand saying, Pastor, I need to pray with you this morning. Come on, with every Christian praying here, Romans says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I want to pray that prayer with you before you leave this morning. We had 13 people in the 9 a.m. daylight saving service that made that decision today. It was an absolute miracle. And I know there's people here today. This is your moment. One, I'm going to count to three. Come on, let me hear your prayers, Christian. One, you need to get right with God. Two, the Holy Spirit's knocking on your heart. Three, come on, lift up your hand right now. You need to come back to Jesus this morning. You need to invite him into your life this morning. Yes, I see hands in the back, hands here on the floor. Here's what we're gonna do. The worship team's gonna begin to play. Don't look left or right. I wanna invite you, step out of your seat, meet me right here, and we're gonna pray together in a moment. Come on, let's worship. Come on down, come on down. It's a good day. All the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will say.
You guys ready for this? You guys ready for this ICLV? Listen, watch this. The first person to respond to the altar call, Monique. Come on, come on, come on. Just close your eyes. The Lord is all over you guys. Close your eyes. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I want you to repeat this after me. We're all gonna say this in concert together. There's no magic in the words. I just want you to say it from a heart full of faith. All right, I want you to say it out loud and proud. And the Lord is moving this morning. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the grave. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Make me a new creation this morning. I turn from my old life and I wanna follow you from this moment on and the rest of my days in Jesus' name. Now just keep your eyes closed. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd fill each person with the love of the Father right now. I thank you that you are crowning them with the smile of heaven right now, Jesus. And I thank you, the Bible says that you have good things for them. You have plans for them, plans not to harm them, but to prosper them, plans for a hope and a future. You're a leader. You're a leader, not a follower. You're a leader, not a follower. You're a leader, not a follower. God's going to use you to lead others. And so, Lord, we bless, we bless, Lord, our family members here this morning. In Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord praise? Oh, we are so happy for each and every one of you. Man, here's what we want to do. We want to pray with you individually just before you leave. We want to share with you some next steps. We're having a water baptism come up. If you've never been water baptized, we want to see you get water baptized. We have some great resources to help you grow in this personal relationship with God. So if you do this, there's a leader behind you right now. If you just turn 180 degrees, you'll see a leader right there, and they want to pray with you before you go. Church, can we give the Lord praise one more time? One more time. Come on. The greatest miracle there is is salvation. Oh, let that never get old to us, God. You glad you came to church? Hey, we pray you have a blessed week. We want to see you in, in small groups. We want to see, we want to hear what God is doing in your life. Have a great week, church. We love you. God bless. God bless. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLV here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.